my name is Quinta Agnele and I'm the literacy facilitator for UNISA. So what I do is I walk you through different aspects of your academic writing. So we look at things like how to write an academic essay, types of essays, how to structure your work, referencing and plagiarism that we did yesterday, grammar and language that we did uh, on Monday, and addressing multiple choice questions that we will do today, and even more as we will unpack different topics during um, the year and the month more specifically. So how I assist you is during workshops, like the one we have in now, which usually is about two hours, and we address a specific topic. Students get to know the theory and ask questions and do some activities where need be. Then we also have one-on-one -on -one consultation with the students where you can now book for a one-on-one -on -one consultation through Mr. Kagiso. And it's just me and you in that session with Mr. Kagiso and we address your specific need. So let's say you have an upcoming assignment and you need help maybe with understanding the question or a grammatical problem or structure, then you can book for one-on-one -on -one, um, appointment and I'll go through your assignment with you addressing your academic writing needs. Please note, I do not help with content. So I won't be able to mark your work or tell you if you are doing right and how many percents you have. So with content, specific questions, you will have to um, book for a consultation. So uh, if it's one on one consultation, then you will have to uh, if it's a content, my apologies, got distracted. If it's a content specific challenge that you're having, then you will have to book for a session with your tutor or your lecturer. But if it's any academic aspects, as I've mentioned, understanding the question, the structure, grammar and language referencing, then you can book to see me and we'll go through a specific challenge. Mr. Kagiso is going to put, um, or let me just check, I think he's done that already. Our email address, thank you, Mr. Kagiso. You will see that he has indicated, you know, the days that are preferable for bookings, but we are open for, you know, um, other days during the week but preferably should be done by Mondays or Tuesdays. But if you have an upcoming assignment and these days are passed, please still send an email and we'll see if it's possible for us to book for a session. My email is, has also been shared. After the session, should you need a copy of the presentation, please just send me an email and I will send you a copy of the presentation. Please note the presentation is for your personal use, not to be cited or shared. Now, um, if you have any questions, please let me know. As the session proceeds, just a couple of ground rules. Please just keep your mics muted. The session is being recorded. It will be edited and shared with students that, attending af that attended after a couple of days. I think five days, seven days uh, and above. Um, working days, of course, and above. So you can contact Mr. Kagiso if you want a copy of the recording. Alternatively, if you want a copy of the presentation, please send me an email. During the session, if you have questions, you can raise your hand. I'm switching between windows. So if I don't see your hand immediately, please just drop a, uh, a, a chat, a text in the chat. So you can use your chat or you can raise your hand to talk to me. All right. If there's no questions, any questions so far, we can start with the presentation. Okay, no questions, let's begin. All right, so today we're going to be looking at what we call MCQs. I'm sure you've heard about this um, in your journey as students, um, even from high school, MCQ is something that from primary school, you know, it's something that we do and the uh, barriers to learning at every stage of our lives you know there's things that can hinder our learning and what we will be doing in today's workshop is the first part will be to really um, address mcq what are mcqs what types of mcqs um that we can have 
uh, what is the advantage? What are the disadvantages? Um, do we change answers when it comes to MCQs? We will discuss some tips and strategies on how to really address uh, MCQs. Then the second part would be looking at some barriers to learning and discussing how we can overcome them. So, um, Please remember to stop me at any time if you have any questions. MCQs are really, you know, something that it, it's a 50-50. It's almost like a gamble. Why am I saying this? You think it's easy because you have to choose options, right? But if you don't have specific strategies on how to approach this, there is a 50% chance that you could get zero. And there's a 50% chance that you could get 100%. Unlike ACEs where you have to, you know, think and give your opinion and structure your work. And we have to look at different aspects to give you the final mark. And ACE, we look at your structure. If you've answered the question, the grammar, the referencing, there's different things we look at, right? But with MCQ, the answer is A. It's not going to change. There's no... A B that could work, there's no half mark, it's either you get it or you don't, right? So MCQs are quite tricky and that is why, you know, we walk you through this just to make sure we maximize your pass when it comes to MCQs. Before we go any further, I want to just have a sense. Can anyone share with me what the experience so far has been with MCQs? Has it been easy? Have you faced challenges? I just want you to share your MCQ experience with me before we get any further. Yes, Hilda? Um, I found them to be quite tricky. So when when doing them um, on um, introduction to law, one needs to be very um, well informed about what is it that they're they are writing about. So, because most often than not, the questions or the statements in the multiple choice questions are sort of uh, too similar. So that Excellent. is a challenge that I've found to be, um, a, yeah, a bit of a challenge, not that much, but once you are, you know, 100% comfortable with the subject that you're doing, then it becomes a bit easier when you have to, to, to do the multiple choice. Thank you so much, Hilda. Thank you so much for sharing that. And Hilda has mentioned two important things, right? Hilda spoke about, um, you know, familiarity with the content. And she, um, you know, also spoke about similarity in terms of the answers. Okay. And I'm going to, you know, talk about these two as we, we go further. Anyone else wants to share one more person to share the experience with MCQ? Thank you, Hilda. Okay, reply finds it difficult because they, uh, they failed, all right? My sincere apologies. And I hope that after today's session, you will be equipped with more skills to nail it, right, the next time. Hopefully you get that 100%. Okay. Yes, Chantel, I think Chantel was about to say something, or was it? Okay, all right, let's carry on then. So as we can see, MCQ is composed of two things. We have the stem that identifies the question or the problem and a set of alternatives or possible answers that contains the best answer to the question and a number of distractors that are plus, pl uh, plausible but incorrect answers. Now, this draws to what Hilda mentioned. Remember, when Hilda was sharing her experience, she spoke about simil similar answers that can be confusing. So it's not by chance. It's actually the intention of the marker to confuse the student or the reader. Why? Because we're trying to avoid a situation where you will guess the answer. Because if you know the right answer, then you will not guess it, right? You will be sure of your answer and not get confused by the distractors. So indeed, Hilda, the alternatives are there to distract you. And when approaching 
MCQs, as we will see, it's really about finding not the right answer, but in your mind, you should be looking for the best answer. So assuming they're all right or the close, but what is the best? If I were to choose, what would be the best answer? So that mindset alone is what will really drive you closer to getting the right answer. Because remember, the others are there to distract you, which means the marker will choose answers that are very similar to the best answer, right? Generally, you will respond to MCQs by indicating alternatives that you believe best answers or completes the stem, right? And we say stem because it's not always a question. Sometimes it's a statement that completes the stem. That is why with MCQ, we say we have a stem and possible answers. So as you will see this example, which of the following conditions represents a bank failure? We have A, B, C, D, and the, the student has to choose the best answer, right? So what is the difference between the MCQ and the AC? As I mentioned when I started, you know, with MCQs, you know, um, you tend to recall facts rather than discussing ideas. So what is this telling us? It's telling us that MCQ is really about your, your retention capacity, being able to recall facts. So it's not really about your, your ability to critique as it is in essays. It's about your ability to recall facts. So what does this mean for you? For you to be preparing for an MCQ, you need to prepare it as if you want to recall information to the best of your ability. They often require descript descriptive, factual, responsive, rather than analytical and creative ones. So with MCQs, your creativity will not be needed that much, right? It's more about factual information. Where, with MCQs, there's often focus on correct answer rather than critical thinking. So it's either it's A or B. It cannot be A and B except, of course, you're, you're asked to choose two plausible answers, which we're going to look at again, you know, when we unpack the questions in answering MCQs. So um, with essays, being concise is key, and there's often a specific number of ideas or facts that you need to mention in order to get the full marks. But really, as we've said, with MCQs, it's one correct answer. So multiple choice then, as we've mentioned above, will consist of a stem, which could be a question or an incomplete statement, right? And the options are the possible answers that the examinee can choose from, so the student can choose from, with the correct answer called the key and the incorrect answers called distractors, not the word distractor. So yes, Hilda, they dare to distract you. Only one answer, may be keyed in as correct. This contrasts with items in which more than one answer may be keyed as correct. Of course, as I mentioned, except they say choose plausible or answers. So you have to choose one that more than one option. So items of the multiple choice are often colloquially referred to as questions, but this is a misinformer because many items are not phrased as questions. For example, they can be presented as incomplete sentences, analogies, it could be a mathematical equation. So the general term is general term or item is more appropriate than question. This is again an example. As you will see, we have a stem and we have the alternative. And you will see the answer is A and the rest are distractors. And these distractors, if we were in science, you will see that they're quite close and can be confusing. Okay, let's look at why do we even use MCQs? So MCQs, really, lecturers will choose this because, you know, it's the best way to assess, you know, students on a larger scale more easily. So what do I mean by this? I can test you on an MCQ for 15 chapters. So let's say I want to test the student's ability to recall information of, for the entire semester. It's easier with an MCQ than with ACs because ACs really, 
you know, will address one specific topic or will test the student on one specific topic, but the MCQ can challenge or test the students over a broader range of topics. So I can decide to say I'll choose two questions per topic and I can extend to up to 15 topics, but with ACES, it will be difficult to do that. So that's one advantage. The fact that, you know, you can cover more topics and a broader range uh, of material when you are, you know, using MCQs. And um, if you're quite good with recording information, then this is also a test that you will benefit from right to be able to recall information easily and then just choose the correct answer also with mcqs because you don't really have to write right this is an advantage and a disadvantage you won't distract the reader with maybe bad grammar let me not say bad incorrect grammar or you know incorrect structure so that doesn't really count your Ability to speak English, and we all know most of us, English is not our first language. So, um, you know, writing sometimes can be daunting. And that is why you see ACES address other skills that MCQs don't. But with MCQs, it's the right answer or it's not. So it's not really about one student having an advantage with a language uh, problem and the others, you know, coming maybe from a disadvantaged background where they did not really have the opportunity to speak English and now they have to write ACEs in English. So MCQs usually takes, you know, away all of the things that can distract you. So we know, you know, you, it's all about the content, the knowledge rather than other skills. So that is an advantage, but also a disadvantage in the sense that when you now get to the work environment, sometimes you may be needed to write reports. And if you were doing only MCQs, you may not have the skills to write a report. You may not have the skills to structure, you know, a report or an essay meant for your work. So that is why you see you are tested in both essays and MCQs. And that is why in our workshops, we have MCQs. And next week, um, end of the week, I'll be having, or tomorrow, I'll be having types of essays. And next week, I'll be having academic AC, the AC itself, right? So that is the advantage and the disadvantage, right? We've looked at the disadvantage, which is it really just, uh, it doesn't allow for other skills to be tested, right? It doesn't allow for creativity. It doesn't allow for high order reasoning like ACEs. So it really is just about facts, but it can cover a broader spectrum. So what are the different types of multiple choice that you can have? You will have your true or false multiple choice questions. You will have matching questions. Choose from a list. Yes or no questions. Best answer questions. Hello? Yes. Do we have a question or someone's mic is... Prince? Prince, your mic is... is Thank you. All right. Okay, sorry, I'm just going back to the presentation. Um, single select questions, multiple select, drop down, drag and drop, star rating. Okay, so these are the different um, types of MCQs that we'll have. For example, you will see here, this is a, a best answer example. So out of the following, which is the best way to eat? You know, you have to choose the best answer. Is it vegan, protein, balance? So what does this mean? It means it's not about which is the right way to eat or which is the best for you. So generally, based on research, based on the books that you read, which is the best? So you have to underline best. So what you're looking for is best, right? So this is, for example, select single example. How often do you purchase from us right so this is selecting you know a single answer choosing from the list what is the title of the book water flow written by simon de Tro? right so now you have to select from the list of available titles which one is the correct title then we have your true or false where you have to read and circle or underline which is true or which is false. 
The Earth is the fourth planet from the sun, true or false, right? Planet Venus has no moons, true or false. So these are an example. So up until now, I just wanted you to know what MCQs are, understand the types of MCQs that they could be out that could be out there. Now the next stage is going to take us over number one. How do you prepare for your MCQs, right? Which is very important because the way you prepare to go write an essay will be different from how you prepare for MCQs. And this is your preparation to the MCQ is what will take you from that 45% to a higher percent, right? Then we're going to look at how to actually do your MCQs and what are some strategies that you can use in doing your MCQs. So now you have an upcoming exam or you have a test. How do you prepare for MCQs? When Hilda started, uh, uh, when she shared her experience, she said familiarity with the content. So MCQs, because you choose truly historically, students don't prepare that much for MCQ because it's easy to guess, you know, answers are provided, it's a question. So it's a 50-50% chance that you could pass, but also 50% you could fail. However, guess what? You have to prepare even more for MCQs than ACs. As we have said, it's about facts, not really your critical thinking, creativity, your ability to write, you know, and convince and argue and critique your writing skills structure. No, it not like with ACs. You need the correct answer. So that means check number one, just as Hilda said, you need to be familiar with the broad range of knowledge and its applications or implications. You need to read, guys. With MCQs, you need to read. You need to read. You need a notebook to take down facts, factual information, main points. You need to question yourself. You need to practice. So for MCQs, you need to start studying early because MCQs usually focuses on assessing your comprehension of detailed aspects of the course. Okay, my apologies about that. I'm just receiving a call. Apologies, I'm going to... Okay, sorry about that. So with MCQs, as I was saying, you need to read more broadly. So it's not going to work if you just, the day before, you just glance through your notes. You have to start reading early. Your short-term memory will not be so helpful because remember the distractors are there. And if you were just cramming quickly to write the test the next day, possibility uh, 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 the possibility is when you look at that distractor, you'll be like, oh, what's happening? What is the right answer? Because now, you didn't read enough, you didn't understand, and you were just cramming, and now with the distractors, you quick, you were quickly distracted from the right answer. So you need to read the course description. You need to know ahead what will be covered. Is it chapter one to chapter three? Is it to chapter four? So talk to your tutor, talk to your lecturer, you know, ask them this MCQ that we're about to do. Is it for all the material covered for one to three lectures? Is it for the term? Is it for the semester? Try to gather as much information as possible regarding that MCQ so that you know when you're reading what is the range that you need to read in preparation of your MCQ. The next thing that is important in preparation for your MCQ and extremely important is to attempt past questions. Now, you will see that students that have been doing MCQs longer usually tend to perform better. It's not just because um, they are more intelligent or they read better, it's because they've been doing it for so long that it's easier. Now, I'm not sure if you've heard about this test. It's the IELTS. It's a, an English test that you do, you know, when you want to get into uh, universities abroad and they use e and English is not your first language. They ask you to take that test. There's also TOEFL. Maybe you've heard of TOEFL as well. You know, these tests, I have first-handed experience, someone who was first English speaking, do the test and didn't perform so well. 
although English was their first language. So it wasn't about the fact that this person could not speak English. It was about the manner in which the test is taken. The, the person was not, and this was a friend, the friend was not versed with the process, how to go about doing that specific test. Because with each test, there's usually tricks, you know, there's usually ways. And if you're just jumping in blindly, not knowing how the test usually is done, then there's higher possibilities for you to fail, not because you don't know the content, but because you don't understand how to go about it. So what am I saying? I'm saying having past questions is extremely important and not just having past questions, putting yourself under the same timing restrictions. What does timing restriction means? There's MCQs where you have to do them in 30 minutes, for example. You're given time. There's MCQs where they give you two hours to do it. There's MCQs where you cannot move on to the next without answering this question and you can't come back. There's those that you can come back, but you can exceed two hours. So if you're to practice, look at the past questions. What are the usually the timing restrictions? Are you usually giving this test over two hours, over 30 minutes? Three hours are usually allowed to switch in between answers, read the kind of instructions in the past questions, try to understand how the questions has been asked in the past, and then put yourself under the same conditions to practice. Because you don't want to practice over five hours and then the test is usually taking over 30 minutes. Now, the time restriction will make you panic because now the test will be going in. You'll be like, oh, my God, you know, you'll be sweating and, and, and getting anxious and stressing. And why? Because you haven't practiced. But if you've practiced, you've already put yourself under the same conditions. That means you won't be scared by the time running down, you know, or you won't be worried about the fact that if I choose this, I can't go back. You have practice. You have been in those conditions before. It's just like, you know, um, going to a new country for the first time, not knowing what's going on, um, how the people behave, how they, they treat others, you know, so you, you panic. But if you're going somewhere you've been before, you're more at ease. You know how to get from point A to point B. You're more relaxed. You know, you're not stressed. So it's the same thing. So, guys, you have to practice, practice, practice. MCQs are almost like maths. The more you practice, the easier it becomes. Okay? Do not memorize the past questions, however. It's really, I'm not saying go take past questions and then cram those answers. Instead, revise with friends, peers, to improve your comprehension of the topics. So in revising, improve your comprehension of the topics. It's not really about cramming, right? Because if you cram and the lecturer changes the question, you might think it's a different question when it's really the same question because what you did was cram the questions and the answers. Now the lecturer comes and is covering the same scope of knowledge, the same content, just ask the question differently. But now you're confused because you cram the questions, you cram the answers, right? So it's about understanding the topics when you practice and understanding how the questions are answered and putting yourself under the same conditions, okay? So in preparation for your MCQs, right? Start by reading and rewriting your notes over and over again. Refresh the information in your head as many times as you can. You can read aloud to yourself or rewrite your notes in your own words. Go slow and don't rush it through. Skimming, you know, can be a waste of your precious time just to skim through the information. So it's not really about just skimming through the information. This is about understanding the information. If you prefer to rewrite your notes, jot them down in a different format, outlines, charts, and idea maps. That will also help, you know, for information that you want to categorize, for example. So this is one way to prepare of, uh, for your MCQs. Read again and again and make notes. You see, I'm not saying cram and skim through the information the day before. 
create acronyms to help you memorize. So these strategies, of course, are things that you can do to help maximize your mark when you get into that MCQ exam hall, right? So how do you create acronyms? So you take the first letters of the key terms and organize them into a word or something you can remember. So try to make the acronym something related to the topic or something you can picture in your mind to kickstart your memory. So for example, you might remember the three branches of the government by the acronym Legislative, Executive, Judiciary, LEGE, right? And recall the acronym by picturing a government executive carrying a ledger, as it sounds similar to the acronym LEGE, right? So something like that. So creating acronyms is a really good way to recall facts, which are the main thing when we're looking at MCQs, recalling facts. OK, so we have the first step, read again and again, make your own notes. The second step, create acronyms. Let's look at the third one. Use word association to grab meanings and key ideas. All right. So you look at words themselves to give you a clue on how to remember their meanings. You can use a prefix or a suffix, right? Of the word. So the beginning or end. So the prefix will be the beginning, the suffix will be the end to jog your memory or sequences of letter inside the word. For example, you might remember the difference between latitude and longitude by taking the first letter of lat, associating it with the word flat latitudinal lines by flat, lay flat on a map. So you will see the example there, for example, um, you know, um, parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, there, bed mass, right? Is it tem das? So something like that. So you need to create your own, do your own word association with your content that you are reading. This can help you again to recall information. All right? Someone asking a question, a mic is uh, unmuted. Let me go to the chat. Um, Mr. Kagiso, if you're here, could you please share the link in the chat? I think some students are trying to join. I'm not sure if they join already. Mr. Kagiso, are you here? Yes, Gwinda. May you please put the link in the chat? I think some students are. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, let's carry on. The next thing you can do to also help in preparation of your MCQs is flashcards. Now, I'm sure you've seen this before and you've used this before, and this is especially beneficial for MCQs. You've seen that prepping for MCQs can be daunting. And if you make it a light you know, uh, task, then you can easily fail. So you need to make flashcards to help you define and link key terms, names, and ideas. So let's say your exam or your upcoming exam, you're trying to remember key terms, names, and ideas. So using your flashcards could really be a good way to recall information. So write a word or phrase on the blank side of the note card and write the definitions, important facts, or associated ideas on the back. So for example, you might write Cold War on one side and Stalin 19... 47 to 1991, arms raised, red skin on the back. So you put the, okay, let's just, sorry, someone's mic is on. Nature, oh, thank you, thank you. You could put Cold War 
on the one side and then the information that you want to remember about Cold War on the other side. And what is really good with flashcards is you can carry them, you know, this quite small, so you can carry them everywhere. You could be transmuting, right? You could be um, moving from home to school or going to the supermarket or whatever the case may be. And while in the taxi or you're at the bank, in the queue or to pay your bills, you're just sitting there, you could be revising your flashcards, right? You have the word and then you read the word and then you recall the information. So it's almost like talking to yourself, but don't worry if the neighbor thinks you're crazy. I'm sure we most of us are crazy, right? <laughs> you know why you're being crazy. You're talking to yourself, but for a really, really good purpose. So just recall the information to yourself. Um, or do it in front of the mirror or in your bedroom, wherever this really works for you, but try to really practice and making sure you understand. Once you've um, kind of, you know, answered the question or provided the information about the word, then you can turn to the flip side, you can flip it and then check the information just to double check if you got it right or if you need to go back to your notes or if you need to read again. But just checking it is also another way to read it again. And maybe you will not need to check it again the second or the third time. So flashcards are really an excellent way to recall information, right? Which is a major skill needed when doing your MCQs. So you could make a cheat sheet with your notes, important facts, formulas, and concepts. Study these, pay special attention to the relationship between the concepts, then go back over your notes to figure out more specific details to fit, fit the bigger picture. What else can we do? Come up with short rhymes to memorize important information. Now, I'm sure to some people this is not going to work. Now, when it comes to rhyming and singing, I'm the worst, right? In fact, I usually say if I sing, my singing could bring down mountains, guys. <laughs> my voice is horrible. I cannot sing even to save my life, right? And when it comes to rhyming, I really, really, I'm not good at that. So if, but some people love singing. And if you're someone that loves music, you love singing, what better way to learn than to learn in a way that you love, right? Um, some people learn better by touching because they're kinetics learners. Some people learn better by seeing because they're visual learners. Others are auditory learners. So these learners prefer to put the lecture, they record the lecture, and then they put it um using their earphones and just listen to it. So the more they listen, the more they get it. They go to the lecture, they just need to hear the lecturer speak once and that is it, they got it. These are your auditory learners. They're really good when you speak it. Then you have those that need to see it. If they don't see it, then it's difficult. Even when you talk, they take down notes because they want to see the notes. They want to be able to see it, your visual learners. Then some want to practice it. They want to touch it, your kinetics learners. So. Again, based on what kind of learner that you are, you will fall back on different strategies. So if you are someone that loves singing, this could work. So create a simple rhyme phrase that contains any key information, including special dates, facts, and names, if applicable. Keep it short and simple so you can repeat it in your head quickly as often as you like. Don't stress about making it a perfect rhyme. Make it close enough to where the sound of the words can jog, uh, jog your memory, right? So in 1949, Columbus sailed the ocean blue or you know, 59 was the date Alaska and Hawaii became the new states, you know. So um, you can rhyme it the way you want. As long as you can make it into a song, into a rhyme, if that will help you recall the information, please go for it. And I'm sure there's some musicians in the room that are good with singing and songs. They're like, mm hmm, this could definitely work for me. All right. Put relevant information into a song as well. So you, it could be a song that you love already. And then you could put relevant information into that song that could help you revise. And I know some of these strategies may sound silly, but truly based on the kind of learner that you are, it could work. And if you've tried multiple strategies, it's not working, 
well, it's not going to kill or, you know, do anything for you to try, right? So I always say the best way to learn is to fail. If you don't try, if you don't challenge yourself and fail before you can be corrected, then you're not going to learn. So try it. Let it be that I try and it did not work than for you not to try it at all because maybe it sounds silly, okay? So this could work. And I'm sure it has worked for some where you take a song and you place important information and form a new song. So it is the same, you know, song with the same um, sound, but you've made it your own through the lyrics by putting in your own important information. So the difference between the strategy before this and this is with the first, the, the one before, you really create your own rhyme. But with the second one, it is an existing song that you love, but then you've changed it to suit your information. OK, write a list. The next thing that you can do in preparing for your MCQs is to write a list of all relevant words and ideas you don't quite know yet. OK, so usually when you read, there's information that if they wake you up from bed, you know. Right. I know this information, I'm aware of it, it comes easily, you know it. But then there's information that you're struggling with a bit. So you may want to focus on those. So go through your notes, the textbook or handouts, and these keywords you are not really sure about. Write the definition next to each, and then, you know, to get the better meaning. So some teachers like to throw curveballs on exams, so be prepared to impress them by even knowing, you know, the most obscure terms or ideas. So you want to ensure that you really know those words that you're not sure about. So if there's any information you're unsure about, you can write a list of those words and then write the definition next to them just to get acquainted to that specific fact. Then increase yourself by writing your own multiple choice questions. So initially I said one way is to practice past questions. But, and I've seen this a lot for primary school learners, they do this a lot, where they, they read their notes and then um, the quiz themselves. So they ask questions and they answer. And not just them, actually I can recall doing that when I was in, in primary school. I used to do that a lot right up onto secondary school. I used to do that where I'll read my notes and if there's no one to help me revise, I write down questions as I go through my notes, I write questions. So I'll read a chapter and then I'll write a question about that chapter. And then later on when I'm done reading, my task will be to come back answer those um, questions, and then I'll check my reader or my textbook to see if I've actually answered the question, and then I mark myself. Then the questions that I haven't answered correctly, then I'll redo them. I go back to my notes, read again, and then do them until I've exhausted the list of questions that I ask myself. So testing yourself, it's important. You don't want to go to an MCQ before you have tested yourself about the material that will be covered. Okay. And you can do that with a friend. You can create questions and then ask your friends to also create their own questions and then you can swap, right? You can swap or make it one full list and then you answer and your friend can mark your script and then you can mark your friend's script. If you have a peer that you study together, that will be even more helpful. Okay. When you are doing your MCQs, so now we've moved past preparation. So what we've looked right up until now are the steps in preparation for your MCQs. What should you do, right? You can quiz yourself, use uh, flashcards, and so on, acronyms. Now, when you are doing your MCQs, what steps should you take? How should you go about it to get the best results? answer the questions you feel the most confident with first and then come back to others. And of course, this is if you're answering the type of questions where you're giving two hours, for example, to answer 100 questions. At your own pace, you can go to and fro or you're in an exam room, you're giving the paper. It's, a, it's, it's not online. It's a copy, a hard copy and you have the full questions and you can answer them as you please. You can start with number 100 and go to 87 and you can do, you know, answer however way you want. 
then what we will advise is always start, and if this applies even with ACEs and any type of question that you're doing, it's always advisable to start with those that you're sure of. I mean, you've read, you've prepared for this exam, so you can't, or you probably won't be going in blank, not knowing anything. I'm sure there'll be a question that you're like, oh, wow, yes, this I know quickly. So what you want to do is answer those that you're confident with first, of course, to maximize your pass rate. Then you want to eliminate answers that are obviously incorrect and then focus on the remaining ones. So for each question, if, for example, let me give an example here. Mm, this is the example I usually go with. Who is the current president of South Africa? Nelson, choice A, Nelson Mandela, right? We have Nelson Mandela. B, we have George Bush. C, Cyril Ramaphosa. D, Jacob Zuma, right? So these are our first options. Now, so what do we mean by eliminate the obviously incorrect? So we have four options. Who is the current president of South Africa? We have option Nelson Mandela, George Bush, Cyril Raposa, Jacob Zuma. So the obviously incorrect would be George Bush. Why? Because, you know, we all know he's never been a president in South Africa. This is the president of the U.S. or he's the past president of the U.S. Even the name will alert you to say, hmm, this name doesn't sound South African, you know? So it could be easier for you to eliminate that as an obvious, not incorrect answer. So you want to, those that you're sure it's not the answer, start with those, eliminate them quickly. Then Nelson Mandela, we all know, may his soul rest in peace. He's no longer here. So you want to also just quickly eliminate that. So then you now want to think about the remaining choices. You know, it should be between Jacob Zuma and Cyril Ramaphosa. Right. Of course, this is an easy question because we know who is the current president, but I'm trying to get to the fact that if the closest will be Jacob Zuma, he is the previous president and, you know, Cyril Ramaphosa now. So then you stay with the closest answers. Right. The next thing that you have to do. Or the next strategy when doing your MCQs is to deconstruct the question first. So you want to deconstruct the question before you even go about answering them. So we're going to address more, we're going to talk more about deconstructing the question when we look at unpacking questions, but I'm going to briefly talk about deconstructing the question. So when you take a question, it's not advisable to just, you know, quickly answer it. First, you want to know if you understand that question. Underlining any important words of that question are there any important words uh, what are the main words of that question what are the tax words so tax words are your words like your discuss describe analyze knowing what these words mean when they say discuss what does it mean when they say identify what does it mean to identify when they say list what does it mean so the tax words are words that tell you what to do and the limit words are words that tell you how far you can go. Now, if the question was, you know, who was the president between uh, in, in the year 2000? Now, the limit there is 2000. So it's not about current, it's about the year 2000. Who is the current president? The limit there will be current. So the answer is about now. Who is the president now as we speak? The present president, right? So you have to identify your limit words. Sometimes it could be choose an example um, given in class. So that means not all examples. We're talking about a specific example provided in class. So the limitation is in class. So what is the limit words in your question? Again, that will help you among the distractors. Then you can say, hmm, before 2000, then the person, it can't be Cyril because Cyril was only appointed in this year. So Pap is obviously out, you know. Then we left with who? Jacob Zuma, Nelson Mandela, right? So this is what I'm saying. So the limit words will also help you to quickly take out some distractors, some you know, to be closer to the uh, best answer. So know your 
your question, understand it, underline main concept, know your tax words and limit words, as this will help you to really choose the best answer. As you see this example, you know, um, your limit words are using the high-low method, so you're asked to use a specific method. So maybe if you have used a different method, the answer will be C. But using the high-low method, the answer can only be B, right? So the limit also will help you take out the distractors. And the tax words, of course, is what is required of that specific question. So this, again, will help you in choosing your answer. When you're doing MCQs also, watch out for the double negative. Just as Hilda mentioned at the beginning, remember, we're there to confuse you, to distract you, isn't it? So double negatives are another way to distract students. So why would I not just say often? Why do I say not uncommon or not infrequently? Because now that is English. I need to think, oh my gosh, what is not uncommon? What is not infrequently? Why did I not just say on uh, 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 um, common. Why didn't I just say frequently? Because frequently, common, they're all the same as not uncommon, not infrequently. But the double negatives are there to confuse you, right? So you need to be mindful. Each time you see a double negative, read again and again to understand what exactly they are saying. And I personally have failed in an MCQ because of the double negatives. It was a 10 question. And when I went back, I realized, oh my God, they didn't mean uncommon. They meant common. And I knew the answer. It wasn't that I did not know the answer. I knew it. But because I did not understand the question, because I was confused by the double negatives, I failed, right? So you need to be very, you know, um, alert with the double negatives. Do not read the potential answers immediately. So with MCQs, read the question, come up with your answer first, and then read the options to see if it has been listed. Now, why are we saying this? Remember, we have been saying again and again. Remember, we've been saying again and again that you cannot and should not be distracted, right? So one way not to be distracted is to come up with your own answer. Now, if you read the question, you know what the question is all about. Then you come up with your own answer. You come up with your own answer. And then you check. Is my answer amongst those that were listed. Now, if you already have an answer, it will be easier for you to say, okay, it's A. Okay, let's go back to our question, right? Who is the current president of South Africa? In your mind, you already said, oh, or you jot it down. If you have a piece of paper, a notebook, or where you're taking notes, you come up with your own answer, you write it down, and then you look at the possible answers. And there, if the answer is there, it will be easier for you not to get distracted. Now, if you see another answer that was a possible distract distraction, it will be easier for you to say, mm, yeah, no, no, mm -mm, this is a distraction. Why? Because you already have an idea. You came up with the answer already. You know the answer. But if you were to just read and read the answers quickly, the answer you thought was right can quickly leave your mind. I don't know if you've sometimes even forgotten. You look at something that you see every day, but in your mind, you, you the answer gets lost. Like suddenly you don't know how to pronounce or what a leaf is or what a mansion is. Like it's a word you use all the time, but suddenly you forget it. I don't know if that has happened to any of you before. You know, it's something like that, that, you know, you could forget the answer just by looking at the distractors. So that is why it's important that for your MCQs that you actually try or attempt. Of course, if you don't know, then you adhere to the previous strategies that we spoke about, you know, the other strategies that we've been looking at, but you want to first come up with your own answer. If it's an equation, a calculation, you want to work it out, you know, work it out. So let's say if they say 
um, you know, find the multiples of, or what are the multiples of three less than 40, for example, right? So what you want to do is you want to actually write it down. Multiples of three less than 40. Three times three equals to, you know, three times one equals to three, three times three equals to nine and so on. Then the multiples will be three, nine, da, 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 da. Then now when you look at your, your answer, you've come up with your own answer, you look at the answer, you have your answers right there. It will be easier for you to say, hmm, there's a 14 there, but 14 is not a multiple of three less than 40. So there you can quickly eliminate the distractors. So work out your calculations before you look at the answers. Don't leave any question on answer unless there's a penalty for getting the wrong answer. Now, there's some MCQs where they tell you that if you get the wrong answer, you get you fail, you get one mark less. So with such MCQs, it's better not to attempt if you're not sure, because attempting means you're losing marks. Except it's that kind of a situation, the advice then is for you to guess the right answer guess remember if you're not penalized for getting the wrong answer that means you get a 50 percent chance of getting the right answer and 100 percent if you don't attempt it at all you will fail but if you attempt even if you do not know possibility is you may attempt may actually choose the right one isn't it so it's better to attempt all 100 answers. So you try the ones that you know first. You work on the ones that you're sure of. And those that you, you're unsure of, you go next. And those that you do not know, attempt them. Just pick anyone, right? And that is where your luck comes in, right? You just pick anyone. And who knows? You could be lucky and pick the right ones. But what I'm saying is I'm not saying leave everything to luck. Because if you leave everything to luck, remember I'm saying there's 50% chance you will fail everything. And you don't want to rely on chance for an important exam. So as we all know, university exams, classroom, and you know, a lot more exams will require you to do one MCQ or the other. So um, let's look at or revise some of the strategies that we've spoken about, things that you can really look into as you embark on this MCQ journey right which to some it's an easy journey and to some an even more challenging journey okay so the first thing is about changing answers now some students will tell you that or some theory say students should trust their first instincts and stay with the initial answer on multiple choice but that is a myth worth dispelling so researchers have found that although some people believe that changing answers is bad, it is generally it generally results in a higher test score. The data across 20 separate studies indicated that the percentage of right to wrong changes is 20%, whereas the percentage to wrong to right is 57%, nearly triple. So that means changing answers can be a good thing, right? So why are they saying this? Why does this research say this? Because Changing from right to wrong may be painful and memorable, but it is probably a good idea to change an answer after additional reflection, right? Indicate a better choice could be made. In fact, a personal initial attraction to a particular answer could be well derived from the surface possibilities, and in MCQs, it could be a distractor, right? So looking at it again, doing some calculations, re-looking at it again and again could actually result to you choosing the right answer. And I've, I have experienced this first-handed when I was taking MCQs. So don't be shy to go back and change an answer if you think again and you're like, hmm. And of course, I'm not alpha and omega to say, okay, um, I'm, I'm sure that you will take make the right choice when you do it again. So I'm not saying if you change it and it's wrong, you know, call Queen and say, Queen, you make me change my answer and it was wrong. <laughs> Remember, I'm saying research, right? <laughs> so it is a gamble. So what I'm saying is if you think carefully and you solve the problem and you see that, you know what, I made the wrong choice, change it. 
All right. The other thing that you want to do in doing your MCQs, any questions so far? Let me just double check if we have any questions. No hands raised, no questions in the chat. All right, let's carry on then. The next thing you want to really do when doing your MCQ, read the entire question. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you, you write your exams and when you go back, you read the question and you just realize you did part of the question. The question had a second and third, you know, wing. You needed to maybe provide examples or you needed to look at just five of something and you did two. And now it's too late. So read a multiple question in its entirety before glancing over the answers. So after you've read it in its entirety, think about the possible option or you'll come up with your own answer before looking at the possible answers. Students often think they know what a question is asking before reading it and just jump straight into the most logical answer. This is a big mistake and can cost you dearly on multiple choice, especially because of our distractors. So read each question thoroughly. Take your time to read the question before and come up with your own answer before even reviewing the options. Answer it in your mind first, as I've mentioned earlier. Remember to answer it in your mind first. After reading the question, answer it in your mind before reviewing the options. Then you want to eliminate the wrong answers, right? This is a summary, as I've said, of the most important strategies in answering MCQs, right? So do not be scared of changing your answers. Read the question in its entirety. Answer it in your mind first. Eliminate the wrong answers, okay? Use the process of elimination across and cross out all the answers you know and incorrect Then focus on the following one. Then in your selection, as I mentioned at the beginning, you're not selecting the correct answer but you are selecting the best answer, right? So it's not just the answer that seems correct because most of the answers will seem correct, they're distractors, but it's about the best answer to the question, okay? Always start with the questions you know first, right? With every exam, I always ask students, start with the question you know first. You want to maximize your pass. You want to ensure that you get the most marks, right? So you want to ensure that you answer the questions you know first. Okay? Imagine you writing an exam or you take the first page of your MCQ and there's 10 questions on that first page. And these are difficult questions and you have three hours to answer your MCQs and then you took over an hour, 30 minutes or two hours just looking at those first ones and you're sweating. And now we just have one hour left. You will beat yourself up after that exam to say, you know, you knew it, you just didn't have time. So to help with time management, to maximize your pass, read through the entire paper, glance through the questions, then always start with the easiest ones. Because if there's 50 easy ones, you show that at least you have 50%. Then you can now struggle with the remaining ones, right? And make your educated guess for those that you do not know the answer to, all right? And words to pay attention to in your MCQs. You know, we, we initially spoke about our double negatives, you know, um, but words like not, sometimes, always, and never. An answer that includes always must be irrefutable. If you can find a single counterexample, then the answer is not correct. The same holds true for never. If an option includes never, a single counterexample would indicate the answer is not correct, right? So if you have those options and there's a never, but then you see something that it's like, you know, close, then the answer is not never, right? Other words to pay attention to, all of the above and none of the above. 
When you encounter all of the above and none of the above answer choices, do not select all of the above if you are pretty sure any one of the answer provided is incorrect. So if you look at the options and one is incorrect, then don't choose all of the above. Then the answer cannot be all of the above. So the same applies for none of the above. If you're confident at least one of the options are correct, then none of the above will not apply. So you just skip. It can't be none of the above because one of the answers are correct. So when there are seemingly two correct answers, right? When you when two answers are correct in a multiple choice question, then and all of the above option, then it's probably the correct choice. Because usually if there's two already, three, four of them will probably be correct. So these are just some you know strategies that can help you to really play around those our big enemies when it comes to the MCQ, which are the distractors, okay? So some tips for true or false questions. Every part of the sentence, sorry, every part of a true state sentence must be true. If any one of the sentence is false, the whole sentence is false despite many other truth statements. So pay close attention to negative qualifiers, absolutes, and long strings of statements. Negatives can be confusing. If the question contains negative as no, not, cannot, drop the negative and read what remains. Decide that sentence is true or false. If it's true, it's opposite or negative. It's usually false. So this is another strategy. So drop it. If drop out the negatives, read the sentence alone, and then you take the opposite, right? Absolute words restrict possibility. No, never, none, always, every, entirely, only. Imply the statement must be true 100% of the time and usually indicates a false answer. So read through it and then use these strategies to see which to go for, for true or false answers. Now, true or false answers are quite tricky. That is why I'm taking time to go through them because it's easier to just say true or false, right? So qualifiers are words that restrict or open up general statement. Words like sometimes, often, frequently, ordinarily, generally, open up the possibility of many accurate statements. They make more modest claims and they are more likely to reflect reality and usually indicate true answers. Okay. Long sentences often include group of words set off by punctuation. Pay attention to truth of each of these phrases. If one is false, it usually indicates a false answer. Guessing. Often true or false tests contain more true answers than false answers. So you have more than 50% chance of being right with a true than a false. However, your teacher may be opposite. Who knows? We may just decide to go the opposite way, right? So why am I again saying this? At the end of the day, guessing is a very strong part when it comes to MCQs, unlike ACs, okay? So test-taking strategy, read the directions carefully. Now, if each question has more than one correct option, there have been instances where you answer a question, you didn't fail it because you chose the wrong answer, but the question required you to choose more than one correct answer. So check, are you required to choose one answer, two or three? Be careful with that. Know if you're penalized for guessing. Know how much time is allowed. This governs your strategy. Review the tests, preview the tests. So go through it first before start doing it. Read through the test quickly and answer the easiest questions first. Map those you think you know in some way. Read through the test a second time and answer the most difficult questions. Then, of course, you will then for last those you do not know at all. You may pick cues for answers from the first reading or become more comfortable in the testing situation. If time allows, review both questions and answers. If it's possible, you miss, it could be possible you misread a question the first time and then the second time now you can understand it and correct the answer. Okay. So let's look at some strategies for difficult questions. So we've been seeing that with MCQs, they are your easy questions. They are questions you do not know where you guess, but the questions that are more difficult. So what strategies should you use for the difficult questions? Okay, after we're done with uh, MCQs, 
we're going to have a break before we look at learning and barriers. OK, we haven't been able to have a break so far because of time restriction, but it's really important we have a break as we look through when we do our exam preparation workshop um, and other workshops, we'll see that rest is really important to understand and, um, you know, um, process information. Or perhaps Queen is just tired and needed five minutes break and forgot her water. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, Queen um, Dabli, please know that yes. Ratisan is having her hand up for a while now. Oh, thank you so much. Since I'm using the other window, thank you. Yes, Teboko, we have a question. I wanted to ask, what is the accurate way to, to write an a MQA question? What is an accurate way to write the question? or to answer the question? Yes. Is to pick the correct answer. It's all about picking. MCQs are all about choosing the best answer. So the accurate way will be to choose the best answer. And all what we've been doing is looking at ways to get to that choice. So how do I get to that choice? So, so far we've seen that there's multiple strategies. You need to prepare. And then while you are there, the best thing would be to first unpack the question, make sure you understand that question. If you understand it, the next thing would be to not look at the answers, choose first or decide what the answer could be in your mind, then look at the possible choices then eliminate those that are obviously wrong and then choose the best possible answer. So it's really about choosing that best answer. So all what we are doing in today's workshop is to provide you with strategies to arrive at that best possible answer because of the distractors. Does that answer you? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Please, if because I'm using the window and the windows mean um, I usually look at the window that um, which is the presentation, so I may not see your hand immediately. So for that reason, if you raise your hand and I don't respond, please feel free to unmute your mic and say, Queen, I have a question. Please stop me. OK. Um, so we have seen this is. Probably there's going to be some repetition, but now let's look at how if the question is difficult. So remember, you've answered the questions you're most confident with and those you do not know, you're going to guess it. Now for the difficult questions, what strategies that we've spoken about that will be most applicable to the difficult questions? Eliminate all the options that are incorrect. So the process of elimination is key for difficult questions. Give each option a question to be true or false test. This may reduce your selection. So ask yourself, is it true? Is it not false for each answer? Questions, options that are grammatically, that grammatically don't fit the stem. So sometimes there's a stem and the answer flows comes behind. Sometimes looking at the grammar part of it to say grammatically, this doesn't make sense. That will probably help you with elimination. Questions options that are totally unfamiliar to you, things that you do not know at all, eliminate those answers. You've never seen them before. When you read, you come across a lot of information and your mind usually you know, stores that as a computer. So usually information you've never seen before will probably not be the right answer. Questions options that contain negatives or absolute words. Try to substitute um, you know, one. For example, frequently, for always or typical for every to see if you can eliminate an option. All of the above, if you know two or three options seems to be correct, all of, of the above will probably be the answer. Number answers, those out high numbers and low and consider the middle range numbers. Look at like options, probably one is correct. Choose the best but eliminate choice, choices that mean basically the same thing and does cancel each other out, right? 
Double negatives create an equivalent positive statement. Echo options. If two options are opposite each other, chances are one of them is correct. So several options that contain qualifiers. The result is longer, more inclusive items that better fill the role than others. So if two alternatives seems correct, compare them for differences, then refer to the stem to find the best answer. Okay. So remember that you are looking for the best answer and Teboko just asked the question and this is it. Remember that you're looking for the best answer, not only a correct one and not one which must be true all of the time in class and without exception. So you are looking for the best answer. Any questions so far with our MCQs? You can copy these links. Unfortunately, I'm not able to use the chat to copy these and paste, but this is these are links, videos, and um, um, websites that you can use to practice MCQs, to know more about MCQs. Um, you can take a snapshot or alternatively, when you request for the workshop, when I send it, you can access them. All right, welcome back, everyone. I hope you were able to quickly you know get a snack or some water or coffee or just rest a little bit um so before we share um our barriers to learning let's first of all answer the question in the chat and any other questions you may have about mcq so hilda is asking what happens when the mcq does not give you the option to revert back to the previous question to make a selection or um, the second question, when you do an online MCQ and you're not sure if the answer to follow is the ones that you have the correct answers to. So the first, uh, for the first one, if and there are MCQs that do not give you that option, then you have no choice but to revert back to the other strategy. So you want to unpack the question correctly, underline important concepts, read it fully, come up with the answer in your mind first, eliminate the wrong answers and then choose the best answer and go to the next. You really don't have a choice. You have to just for every question, you have to do your best. Make sure you've done your best. And remember with this option, you don't even have the chance to um, um, go back, you know, like changing answers to go back and choose again. So you need to make sure the answer or your selection at that moment is the best. If you think about it again, unfortunately, you won't be able to go back. So you just need to give more careful thought to the answers before you choose them. Unfortunately, some MCQs are that way, okay? And what could also guide you is assuming, for example, um, you have 100 questions to answer in three hours. So you know that, okay, each question, if you want to go through the 100 questions, because you cannot go back, you can give yourself about a minute or so for each question. So to maximize your time, you also don't want to give each question five minutes and realize, um, you know, three hours after that, you've only answered 20 questions and it's an automatic fail. You can't even get a 50 percent. So the time will also guide you as to how much time you the, 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 the sorry, the number of questions and the time you have for the overall test will guide you as to how much time you have per question. And if you're not, you're doing online and you're not sure of which answers to do will be easier, again, the same strategy applies. Again, you will just have to make sure you give equal timing for each question and keep moving. You don't want to give if you have 100 questions to do in, in three hours, you don't want to spend 10 minutes on a question because the next question could be easier, but who knows, it could be more difficult. So what you want to do is just share your time more equally across the questions and give each question an equal chance to get an answer. So in that case, it, each question will get an equal time and an equal chance. Hilda, does that answer you? Yes, Quinta, thank you so much. So what are barriers to learning? OK, so simply put, a barrier to learning is any obstacle that stands in the way of a student receiving the best 
education, right? So barriers to learning can be environmental, it can be social, it can be emotional or even psychological. So things that really enable you to understand facts and retain concepts. So there are many things that can influence your ability to learn. Your ability to identify these uh, barriers will definitely put you in the best place to overcome them. I always say a problem well, this, this, there's the saying, a problem half shared is it's half, a problem shared is half done, solved. Yeah, something like that. But also identifying a problem is the first step in solving them. Now, if you realize in your life generally, if even when you're sick, what is the first thing you want to do? You want to know what is the problem because being sick is very general. You know, your body just is not responding. But first, when you go to the doctor, what does the doctor do first? The doctor wants to identify what the problem is. Is it a stomach problem? Is it headache? Is it, you know, what is the problem before medication can be prescribed? Because if we don't know what the problem is, then we cannot find the solution. So knowing the problem is the first step solving any problem. So that is why it's important that as we go through these barriers, you start thinking about your own specific barriers to your learning. So I did um, ask you to think about it and share. So anyone wants to share so far? Uh, thank you, ma'am. So with regards to, because we were speaking about uh, multiple choice questions, I will say what I found to be a bit of a barrier for me uh, was especially with a timed um, multiple choice questions is that you may find that you do know the answers, but because we're just too quick in trying to read what the question was, one ends up um, making a wrong selection. So my issue is that with timed multiple choice questions, because I take a bit of time to, I, I fully want to understand what is it that I'm reading. Sometimes uh, time is not uh, sufficient for you to fully read, to comprehend what the question you know wants you to answer. So that is what I would say uh, is my challenge. But otherwise, um, uh, I do not have a lot of barriers, except that, yeah, when it's timed, I think, I guess, uh, the the time makes me a bit nervous. So I try to sort of get through all the questions, but eventually, you know, uh, that may result in me getting a uh, lower marks. Thank you so much for sharing that, Hilda. Um, and I hope that the strategies that we've discussed, you know, could help, you know, in just getting the best answer. And there's really, um, you really just have to try to share the time more equally across questions, but you need to unpack those questions. You need to understand it. Don't rush over it. Remember, it's better to be sure of 50 than to be unsure of 90, right? So you want to really unpack those questions and not get so pressured about the time that you end up just rushing through everything um, without really maxim maximizing your past in some questions by unpacking them. Um, thank you, Hilda. But when I meant barriers to learning, not really for the MCQs, but anything that can hinder your learning as a student. So, for example, any financial challenges, language barriers that you may have, you know, economical challenges, being a first generation student. So things that prevent you from doing your best at university. Yesterday, someone spoke about, I can't remember, but someone spoke about um, disadvantaged students, you know, being disadvantaged students at UNISA. So tapping more into that, do you feel disadvantaged in any way? Are you facing any challenges? Or have you experienced a friend face a specific challenge or a family member or someone else? So, yes, now that you're speaking about people that we know of friends, I think maybe that is why people were not raising their hand because maybe they're not uh, directly uh, affected. So what I've um, picked up from most people on our groups is that most of them are still very new. The online learning thing is quite new to them. So they're yet they still have not yet, um, you know, found their way around this uh, online learning uh, platform. So it becomes difficult for them to to be on par with what is happening on different modules. 
And the other challenge or barrier that I saw is that um, most of us wait for the last minute to prepare for our examinations or our learning. So you, you spend the entire month not going through your books or your studies. And at the very last minute, you know, that is when you, you realize that examinations are very close or, or assignments are due. And now you do not have sufficient time to cover everything that has been done, you know, from the beginning of the year until the examination time. So that is what uh, I've picked up from, from um, our fellow students. Hello. So I am I am a first time student and I am a bursary beneficiary. So I found that my problem is that I'm doing most of my assignments on my phone because I haven't um, received um, the, a laptop yet. And um, I have using a phone that doesn't have um, what is this? The selfie functions is not working properly. So on an, an assignment that required me to switch on um, a webcam, I couldn't do and stuff like that. So um, also I'm finding, I was finding it a, a, a bit uh, difficult to maneuver the system, but I think with time you get used to it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bridget. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Any other person would like to share? Yeah, it, 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 it actually happened to me, but then I think now I'm getting there bit by bit. Uh, you get yourself to, to on a point where like you have to uh you have to balance from maybe let's say now I'm doing my 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 uh, another training like apprentices, you know what I mean. So I have to balance the workload on my training, and then I have to balance my studies, and then yet this whole thing is online, you know. So it's it's not really easy for me to can interact with people around me. So it it has been a nightmare, but uh, now because of I think at least I'm I'm trying to have like uh, strategies and and I maneuver, I, I can maneuver the system like much better than before. And so far after writing like few assignments for other modules and then submitted, and then I, I, I received some results and it was a little bit high. And then I got a little bit confident on my self-esteem in the sense. So it wasn't really that easy for me, but I think I'm I'm getting there. But yeah, thank you very much. Thank you to those candidates and those they have experienced through others. Um, you know, this was just an activity, you know, for you to be able to really share this because sometimes talking about it is the first step to solving it. So I might introduce all the challenges, but definitely, you know, talking about it is talking to each other's colleagues and finding ways in which we can help students to overcome some of these barriers. So I'm going to talk about the one that I think others that have been using the online learning platforms. It is a challenge, you know, in most institutions and sometimes you get acquainted to one and it gets to change again for your more um, advanced or um, um, your higher students and then it gets changed again. So as we are living in a world of in a world of constant change as a student, you need to be aware that things will always change. So the mindset is the first thing that I will advise students to do to have what we call the growth mindset a mindset that is open to change, a mindset that takes challenge as you know, something, you know, good and not something that they give up on. So when there's a new challenge, you instead of giving up, you keep forging your way through it. You keep pushing and doing your best instead of giving up because we are in a world of constant change. And COVID has taught us that things can change even faster than we we, we think, right? So what you want to do is to be open to this change. Be open to learning. Go on YouTube. Google that specific online learning platform. How do you do it? How do you navigate it if you have a question? 
um, book for consultations with your tutor. Go to your lecturer's office. Go to the library. If you have technological challenges, maybe you have um, a device that you're not able to use. See if you can speak to a friend that has a better device and use it maybe just for that specific time you have a lecture or a brother or a sister see if you can even borrow a laptop from someone see if you have you know the financial uh, means maybe you can go onto the unisa physical space into the library they will have computers there for an important test you can travel to unisa you can use their library computers you know to do your assignment especially if it's you know a once off thing looking maybe into your financial um, um, constraints in traveling to UNISA every single day, maybe just for that test, while of course waiting for your laptop to be granted, you know, and being a first time, you know, student, I can understand how difficult that might be, you know, just mm -hmm. understanding how the test, the way the test is different, you know, there's more independence, there's more self-learning and self-growth than it is in schools. So a lot of the responsibilities fall in your shoulders and there's more responsibilities, you know, and having sometimes to balance that work at school and the work that you have to do, as Tapelo was mentioning, could be daunting. I myself as a student, I when a while I was doing my master's, I had to do my master's and I was doing four jobs, four different jobs. I was a tutor, I was a senior tutor, I was an academic literacy a facilitator and I was a writing consultant. So I had to do all of that because I had to pay my fees, my rent and all of that. And it was difficult, but having the mindset, knowing what you want, pushing for your goal, I've got to do this. Looking at the long term, what do I get after this? If I push, what do I get? You know, just staying positive, being surrounded by family, by loved ones, not those that will put negative criticism and bring you down, turn them off. Those that can say, you know what, Tapelo, you can do this. You know what, Hilda, you can do this. Bridget, you can do this. Those kind of friends, those kind of peers that will push you and encourage you to keep going, that can really help. And um, you all spoke about time management, which is a big challenge that students face, but not only students, even workers, you know, time management is a big, you know, um, um, thing. And please look forward to the critical thinking, time management and group work workshop, because what I'll do is I'll take you through how to manage your time, which hopefully will solve some of the challenges that you are talking about in terms of time management. And if you're still struggling, Right. If you're still struggling with your with managing your time, please, you can book for one on one session with me and we can walk through. Having you to get a better schedule, a better plan or managing your time even better. So the workshop will be there to help you with time management, but you can also book for one on one consultation because it is a big thing in our lives in general as students, as parents, as you know, um, brothers and sisters, because we are not only students, but we occupy different roles in the society that we are in. And it will also help when we talk about last minute to prepare for exams, as Hilda mentioned, what we need to do is just like MCQs, ACs, prepare before. You can't wait for the last minute, right? Again, it boils down to time management. So please look forward to that workshop. It's the critical thinking, group work and time management workshop. So we'll go through best ways to manage your time. OK, technological challenges. That is another challenge, right? So go to your library, see the, the, the different options that are available in terms of um, workshops, in terms of, you know, um, to really help you understand these different tools. YouTube is very helpful. Google is very helpful. You have to be that 21st century student that is always quick to Google. There's even chat GDP now, you know, that you can ask some questions and get some answers as well. So use the technology that you have to get used to the technology that you need. OK. All right. Then the others, the other challenges that you can see on the slide, we have um, peer pressure. Now, peer pressure can go both ways. You have students failing because um, there is the pressure from their peers, right? 
So you have some peers that, you know, will pull you out of your study time. And you have peers that will give you or are thinking they're giving you the best support by pushing you too much to a point where you feel overloaded and you can't do it anymore. So you have to find that balance, right? To be able to say, this is my best, this is not my best, and just strive for your best. It is about your best, just do your best. Um, when my niece was not doing well and she had her marks, there's one thing I asked her. She, she had 60%, I think, and she wasn't happy. And I ask her, was it your best? Because if it were your best, then you did your best. Then you have to be happy. And she told me, I can do more. I just was lazy and took certain things for granted. Then I'm like, excellent. First, you're unhappy. That means it wasn't your best. You identify some of the challenges or the things that made you not to do this. So go back to the drawing board, see what were the distractions, what distracted you, what were the reasons, and then see how you can overcome them. So my question to you is, are you doing your best, right? If you are, then keep doing your best. Don't be influenced by peers. There's family background, which is a lot that we don't have control over. I'm glad that UNISA has bursaries already, as one of you mentioned, to help. That is uh, um, great. You know, when it comes to family background, it's also about being first generation. Some students are the first in their families to attend university. So that means they wouldn't have that support at home to help with homework, to help understand how university life operates, which is quite different from high school. So they face a lot more challenges, not from just being first time students, but from being first generation students. So try to see if you can get help from the UNISA counseling which I think is first floor for Johannesburg students, but you can also inquire through email. You can ask, I think even Mr. Kagiso could be able to help you with referring you to the right counseling um, services. But Mr. Kagiso, if you're online, please, if you can, um, you know, just type in how the students can get some counseling should they need help with financial uh, you know, problems, emotional problems, because there's some emotional problems that can also hinder you as a student, you know, um, there's abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, you know, there's bullying that can really affect, you know, your learning and being able to speak to someone, you know, can truly help you navigate these challenges, right? Students with disability, lack of self-esteem or confidence, um, these are all emotional you know aspects that can influence your bullying and you could think low self-esteem why it is because when you don't trust yourself when you don't have confidence in yourself or you always look at the negative things about yourself it's easier for you to to fail because you're like you know already you're negative positivity attracts positivity so keep affirming i am beautiful i am handsome i'm intelligent i can do this Affirmation, positive affirmation usually leads to positive things. So confidence, if you don't even believe in yourself, then no one will, right? If you don't believe you can do this, then no one will. So it starts with you. Charity starts at home, isn't it? So you have to be confident about yourself. You have to compliment yourself. You have to take care of you. You have to love you first before anyone can love you, right? So you need to take care of your emotional self. Um, um, Tapelo mentioned this already, he spoke about work balance, you know, so work barriers can also be a problem, you know, uh, be discrimination from work or shifts or isolation. This can again influence your studies. So what you want to do is to identify them, see if you can negotiate times with your workplace, see if you can fix your schedule, see if, you know, you can have better shifts if it's isolation get those moments where maybe you can go to a friend you know work from there or go even to a public space and work from there especially if you don't need to unmute your mic or if you don't need to be talking so look for ways to get out of that isolation so if you of course are a student with disability then you should look for you know help with this UNISA counseling services Okay. okay, let's go back to the presentation. So um, please try to speak to, you know, the counseling um, services at UNISA if you have any concerns or 
you know, you struggle with emotional, you know, the SRC is also available there for students to help with, you know, um, different aspects um, that could hinder your um, learning. OK, so please email Mr. Kagi. So if you need maybe contacts, I'm not sure how to get to the SRC or the counseling services. You can email Mr. Kagiso if you need further information. I'm sure we could find out, you know, um, more information for you. Lack of focus and concentration can be a true barrier. And what you want to do when you study, when you're a student, is to minimize all distractions as much as possible. So. What is important as a student is to avoid all distractions. So take away things that you know are a distraction to you. Always have your to-do and undo list. For example, Instagram is my pain. I know if I have important tasks to do, I do not go close to Instagram and Reels, right? Because I could be there for hours before even realizing it. So you need to know what is distraction to you and eliminate it. Always realizing after you achieve your aim, you will have time for anything else. Fear of failure. Well, if you don't try, you will never know. So do not be scared. Go for it. You can do it, right? Emotional factors will always be there, but what you want to do is surround yourself with loved ones, have a positive mindset, and use counseling services if possible. Past experience can be a true hinder because you've had a bad experience, it influences the future. Well, a past experience gives you strategy to cope with the next challenge. So take bad experience as an opportunity to learn and grow, and do not let it pull you down, okay? Uh, I watched a YouTube video and this guy was saying, I forgot his name. He said he held a glass of water. And on that glass of water, it was a glass of water of maybe, let's just say six ounce, ounces of water, maybe one, let's just say 0 0.5 kilo, right? And he said, if I hold that 0 0.5 kilo of a glass for one minute, it's not going to behave. If I hold it for one hour, it will get heavier. Two hours, my hands will start shaking. Three hours, I may not be able to bear the pain. What was he trying to say? The more you hold on to bad experiences, the more you hold on to pain, the more heavier it becomes. So move past those challenges. Look at it from a positive mindset and keep striving ahead. Always be strong. Resist. Look for solution. Just be positive. And again, I'm going to give you these links that could help you navigate more barriers or think about the barriers or look further into the barriers that we have just discussed. We have come to the end of our presentation and we've looked at MCQs, how to prepare for your MCQs, what MCQs are best ways to approach your MCQs. And we've also looked at some possible barriers to your learning and how to overcome it, which in one word I will say have a positive mindset. In second, in a second sentence, I will say do not give up, keep going, and thirdly, love yourself and take care of you. And in this same line, I really truly be, uh, wish you the best as you navigate your journey as a student. I know you're not alone. Always, you know, hang on to anyone that can help you through this journey. Thank you so much for taking the time to attend this workshop.